Hello everybody and welcome to my first of three videos on this, the Nikon F5, a much requested and unfortunately long delayed video manual. The Nikon F5 is a professional tier 35mm interchangeable lens SLR. So what does all that mean? Professional tier simply means that this was the flagship, the top end 35mm camera from Nikon. 35mm means it can take any 35mm film you would like to put into it and that it can take photos on it. And given this camera's capability, that really is any 35mm film. Interchangeable lens, SLR, means interchangeable, means that the lens can be taken off and a new one can be put on at any time, except when you're taking a photo, without messing up your images or your film. And SLR means that the camera has a single lens and that the image from this lens travels onto a mirror up through this prism and then to the viewfinder. This is a reflex prism. The, the camera has 3D color matrix metering with a 1005 pixel red, green, blue sensor. Now what that does is that when you're in 3D color matrix metering mode, and it, in video three we'll talk about how to set all of the different specific metering modes and, and exactly how they all function. But in that mode, the camera will take distance information from some Nikon lenses, specifically AID and I think AIG, and we talk about that in video three as well, or two, one of those later. Um, so it takes that distance information, and then the red, green, blue meter sensor reads the light coming through the lens to determine the color breakdown as well as the contrast in the scene. So it knows those things as well as the distance to your subject from the lens, and using all of those data points, it creates the best exposure that it can give you. In addition to 3D color matrix, it has center weighted spot and full scene average metering options. The shutter speeds are 30 minutes to 1 8,000th of a second bulb and 1 250th of a second for the flash sync. Now, those of you who know the Nikon F5 very well will say, actually, it's 1 300th of a second. Yes, but at 1 300th of a second, you don't get full flash power. 1 250th of a second is the fastest speed at which you get full flash power for your, um, your shutter, for your flash sync. The camera has a 0.75x viewfinder magnification with 100% frame coverage. All right, so what does that mean? Here, this is your viewfinder. What you see in here is 75% of the size of what's going to be on your film because what you see in here is the light traveling through the lens just prior to when you take your photo. 75% x is not huge, but it's not a problem for cameras which are intended to be used with autofocus lenses. Older cameras than this would have had 85, 95, some of them a little bit larger. Medium format cameras, it's not uncommon for them to have a 100% um, viewfinder magnification, especially on waist viewfinders, because manual focus lenses benefit from a larger and brighter viewfinder. This being a primarily autofocus intended camera can get away with a smaller viewfinder, magnification rate that is. The one, the 100% frame coverage, what that means is let's say you're looking through your viewfinder right now and you see this scene in front of you. Exactly what you see right now is what's going to be on your film. There's no cropping in your viewfinder versus what's actually going to be on your film. The Nikon F5 has both interchangeable prisms and interchangeable focusing screens with four prisms and 10 screens that were available in the video's description for after this video, of course. There's a link to a website called MIR or Mirror, I'm not sure which, and they have a complete breakdown of all of those focusing screens and prisms. This was also, of note, the most capable Nikon film SLR ever made. It was also the foundation of Nikon's digital SLR lineup in its entirety. The, if you've seen my D1 video, you'll know that I mentioned in there, there that the D1 was built on an F5 chassis. There was an F6, and I'm going to make the argument that the F6 was less capable, and I don't think there are tons of people who will disagree with me on that, because this simply had more accessories it could use and things like that, and also this had just some... This camera really feels like Nikon sat down with their engineers and said, you know what? Go crazy. Make it. 
do whatever you guys can dream up and turn into reality. This camera is incredible. Onward and upward, the target market for this camera was the professional photographer, and we know that for many, many reasons, but the most noteworthy of them being the myriad features and accessories that were available, uh, the prism and the focusing screen being the really big ones. Prisms, interchangeable prisms are huge, and they were significantly harder to engineer and manufacture than fixed prisms just because of the tolerances involved with the way that a prism mounts onto the camera in order to ensure that the focus is correct in the viewfinder. Also, the, um, it has exceptional build quality and an incredibly rich feature set. And we're gonna go through all of them in these videos. This is, I think, the single most complicated uh, film camera I will ever review on this, or well, I will ever make a manual for on this uh, channel or in this series. So it's all easier from here. Okay, so this was made by Nikon in Japan from 96 until 2003. Pretty decent run for a late film era professional grade camera. It's preceded by the Nikon F4 and followed by the F6. As we do, we're going to go over the different features and things on the camera, starting on the top, and though technically on the side, and kind of pretending to be on the side, pretending to be on the top over here, we have the strap lugs, and this is what you would connect your camera strap to. This right here is the mode dry, the <laughs> this right here is the drive mode dial release. And so this, this ring right here, that's got a knurled edge around the outside, this is the drive mode dial, and I can't really move it until I push the release and now it unlocks it and I can select a different drive mode. This is the film back release lock. So to open the film back, as we'll see in a moment, you push this to the side, lift this up and the film back will, will open. This is the film rewind knob and lever. These indicators are for what your drive mode is and we'll see those in detail in video too. You can see the top there, that's a red light that indicates your film is being rewound. Prism, hot shoe diopter adjuster, metering mode switch, metering mode index, film plane indicator. This is to indicate exactly where your film plane is for doing high magnification macro work. Multiple exposure button, LCD screen, autofocus area selector, shooting mode selector, EV compensation button. This is your power button, right? Power button unlock but right here, power switch, as well as LCD illuminator switch, shutter button. Uh, have it set to 25 minute <laughs> exposures. There we go, we'll just turn that off. On the front of the camera, we have the front command wheel. Here we have the lower power button. Uh, here we have the lower shutter button, right down here. This is the lower shutter button. And then this switch turns the lower shutter button on or off. This just makes it a lot easier to shoot in portrait orientation on the fly. This is the depth of field preview button right here. This will stop down the lens so you can see your depth of field. This is your mirror lockup switch. So if you want to lock up the mirror for something like a Star Trails photo or a macro photo that needs a long exposure, you can just lock your mirror up here and eliminate that part of the shutter shake right before your photo. Lens mount lens meter couple right here. That's this ring on the outside. That It was possible, no longer, at least not through Nikon, to have this replaced with a, a ring that could be popped back so that pre-AI and NAI lenses could be mounted on this. I don't know how many of those were done because I've never actually seen an F5 that has that modification to it. So uh, historically, it was possible. Whether or not um, a private shop could do it today or not, I can't tell you. Lens mount index, lens release button, autofocus mode selector with manual at the bottom, single shot in the middle, continuous at the top. And basically the difference here, single shot will find focus and hold, continuous will keep tracking. So continuous is really good if you're using autofocus for moving subjects. Single shot is really good if they're stationary like still lifes, portraits, macros, things like that. Self timer button. And this is your flash PC port underneath this cover right there. There we go. Make and model. And then there's a little window here on the front of the prism that allows uh, light reflecting off of the aperture ring. 
on your lens to be visible in your prism so that you can see in your prism exactly what your aperture is set to. On the camera's back, we have film rewind button number two, which in conjunction with film rewind button number one, which you push in the order of their numbers, causes the film to rewind. Light indicating that the film is being rewound. This is the prism release button. Prism shade, so if you're doing something like a star trails or a long exposure or dark uh, pitch black or dark room flash photography, you can put the light, the shade down and ensure that no stray light coming in through your viewfinder fogs your image. It is theoretically possible that light coming in through your viewfinder, which your viewfinder light travels through it both ways, both from the lens and then this way to the lens, with your shutter up, light could potentially work its way around a shutter. I don't think that would be an issue with this camera. Anyway, viewfinder, AELAFL button, autofocus on button, lower autofocus on button, right down here, rear command wheel. This is the cross pad control. Down here we have a series of different function buttons, your ISO selector, flash mode selector, bracketing button, lock button, which by the way on this camera does not work, I don't think, so I, uh, I'm not going to be able to demonstrate that. I tried getting it to work the other day and I could not, so either I'm doing it wrong or the button doesn't work. Uh, custom functions button, Nikon and serial number, LCD screen, remote control port. On the camera's bottom, we have a tripod socket. On the camera's side right here, we have the battery chamber release lock so that we can pull the batteries out. Uh, there were a few different battery pack options we'll talk about in the second video, but if you can get your hands on the AA adapter like this, it is worth its weight in gold because the rechargeable options for this camera are pretty much shot because they are all at least 20 years old. This re or mostly at least 20 years old. I'm sure they were made for some time after this camera exited production. This is the film type window so that you can see what type of film you have in the camera. Now to open the back of the camera, you slide this button toward in the direction of the arrow and then you lift up on the film rewind knob and the film back opens. Inside of the camera, we have the film cassette chamber, which we'll see how to load film into in the second video. Film guide rails, and these guide rails help keep the film from moving up and down, as well as keeping it flat as it moves through the camera so that your images are focused correctly. Shutter, film take up sprocket, film take up wheel or spool. You might be able to see down there in the corner, there's an arrow with a red index. That's the film loading index data and electronic contacts for the uh, film back right here. Contact receptacles. We have a tensioning wheel that will help keep your film pressed here correctly so that it advances. And your film pressure plate to help keep the film flat as it moves through the camera. Okay, some tips for using your camera. Ideally, this should not be your first camera as there is way, way too much about this camera to understand for it to be a good first camera. This is so incredibly complex. It, I cannot stress it enough. The next thing is you wanna use the custom functions to set up those functions that you would like to have be the same and then leave them set up that way. Try to avoid changing configurations as much as possible because the more that you change your configurations, the harder it's gonna to be to, to predictably understand how this camera is going to function. So in video three, when we see the custom functions, I'll show you, I'll explain what those do and how they affect your photography so you can set them up one time and leave them. I mentioned the AA battery pack and like, let me stress again, it really is worth it to buy that. The rechargeable pack options are old and they are likely unreliable. This camera in fact came with a rechargeable option on it and uh, it loaded into it when I got it and it, it wouldn't charge, not at all. Like the charger wouldn't even recognize it. So after I got the AA battery pack, which was not easy to find, I won't lie. Um, and I had to settle for one that had a crack in it, by the way, which is fine, it doesn't affect the use. Uh, at any rate, after I got the AA battery pack, I was finally able, like four months later, to see if this camera even worked. And uh, so I decided to tear open the rechargeable pack that this had in it, and all of the cells in the rechargeable pack were covered with exploded alkaline battery, uh, alkaline crystals. So um, 
the AA battery pack is worth it. Also, remove the batteries if you're going to let this camera sit for more than a few weeks because exploded AA batteries can absolutely destroy your camera. The corrosion from them can follow the electronics into your camera and destroy the circuit board. In addition, exploded batteries are an absolute pain to get out of the camera and they can really do some lasting damage to your battery housing, which makes it very, very hard for it to function correctly. Some things not to do with your camera. You don't want to touch the shutter or the mirror, if you can at all avoid it, because those are both things that you can damage. With your finger oils, if they get on the shutter, they can eventually um, cause it to get a little bit out of time or potentially jam. Or if you put your finger through it, that could really destroy your shutter. The mirror, if you get your finger oils on it, could tarnish, and that could affect your metering as well as your ability to focus. Also, don't leave your camera or your lenses in your car because heat can affect the, the, the components in it. And a big one is that oils that are in the lens or in the camera's mechanical components can get very thin in the heat. And then it flows to places it shouldn't be. And when it gets back to its normal viscosity, uh, you've got a problem because that, that oil isn't supposed to be there. Then the other thing is that if it gets really cold in your car, it can break down and become gummy and then that can ruin your camera's mechanical operation as well. Plus, just as a general rule, this camera looks digital. It looks expensive, and it is. By film camera standards, this is not a cheap camera. It would be something that would be very tempting to have stolen out of your car. Don't store your camera in a plastic bag or box unless you have a very good rechargeable desiccant pack that you keep recharged. Moisture can permeate plastic, and that can cause fungus to grow on your optics and in your prism, as well as mildew to grow in the rubber of your camera. And just remember, your Nikon F5 is a precision tool that should be handled with care and respect. And as long as you take care of your camera, your camera will take care of you. So that's it for video one. We talked about what everything is. In video two, we're gonna talk about what everything does and what, how to use it for your photography. And then in video three, and in video three, the only thing we're gonna cover are the custom functions because I believe that there are 24 of those. It sounds right. And it's a lot to go over, so we're gonna do it in its own video. See you guys in video two.